Live from Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's The Cube at the MIT Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Symposium. With hosts Dave Vellante and Paul Gillen. Welcome back to Cambridge, Massachusetts, everybody. We're here at the MIT Information Quality Symposium, the Chief Data Officer Conference, uh, the leading, I think, event on the whole issue of information quality and, and the emerging role of the Chief Data Officer. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon. I'm here with my co-host, Paul Gillen. Uh, thanks, David. I want to introduce our next guest because we go back a long way. You know, I've been in this business uh, 32 years. It was uh, 1982 when I started at Computer World. And there's one uh, person who has sort of dominated a landscape, the landscape of data warehousing, data management for, for all that time. Uh, and you don't see it that many people who, are, who have that kind of position for so long. It's Bill Inman, uh, known as the father of data warehousing, the author of uh, 52 books. And uh, it turns out that we have uh, a, we had an intersection point in our careers long ago that I just found out this morning, Bill. Well, gee, Paul, I never forgot because uh, many years ago when I was starting my career, uh, the first publishing adventure I ever had, you were my editor. And uh, I, listen, I remember you. I just remember you don't remember me. Well, I remember you. You're 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 God, uh, Bill, in, in in this business. I just don't. And I remember uh, uh, seeing your name in Computer World, but I didn't remember that I had, that I had played some small role in your in your success. But uh, data warehousing certainly uh, uh, has has shifted, come of age. Uh, perhaps it's morphing into something else right now. Uh, some people would say data warehousing never really lived up to its expectations. What what would be your opinion of that? Well. Uh... I think if you take a look at the need for corporate architecture, uh, I think data, data warehousing, at least in my perspective, certainly has lived up to its uh, expectations. Uh, but uh, uh, on, a, on a personal basis, I, I really haven't done anything with data warehousing in, in over a decade. Uh, so uh, I've kind of left data warehousing behind. Uh, I still have many fond memories, and I still occasionally talk with people on the on the subject. But uh, uh, it's something that uh, is certainly is of interest to me. But I'm not actively involved. But what you are actively involved with right now, through your company Fox Run, is text analytics and mining text for, for context and meaning. Big problem that, that uh, uh, many, many smart people have been attacking for a long time. Uh, have you finally cracked the code? Uh, I think we have. Uh, we've taken a different approach. Uh, the approach that we've taken is that in order to do a credible job of managing text, uh, you've got to start with context. And unfortunately, context is difficult to find and deal with. Uh, it's taken myself and my researchers, uh, 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 oh, I would say 12 years uh, of, of starts and stops and a lot of failures along the way, uh, but we're now at the point where uh, in terms of uh, dealing with text, uh, at a very profound and deep level, we're able to do that. And can you give us an example of how this, how your technology is, is being used right now? What are some real world examples? Uh, some real world examples are, uh, number one, in terms of call center data, uh, most corporations have call centers. Most corporations can tell you how many calls they get and how long the calls are, but that's about all they can tell you. And unfortunately, the conversation between the company and its customers is very important information. And so what we're able to do is go in and understand that information and organize it so you can put it into uh, a database. An another uh, interesting uh, arena that we're working in now is in healthcare, uh, uh, being able to take healthcare records. Healthcare records are kind of interesting in that you must have healthcare records in a narrative form. Why? Because doctors and nurses need to look at that narrative information. And so it's, it's absolutely mandatory that healthcare records 
uh, be in a narrative form. The problem is that data that's in a narrative form cannot be effectively analyzed by a computer. And, and so in order to get a proper analysis done, you've got to take that narrative information and turn it into a form that can be analyzed. So those are, and, and there's a lot of other examples out there, but those are two of the more interesting examples. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about sort of this initiative that you're taking on. So it sounds like you can ingest um, voice uh, and, and presumably social data and, and diverse data types. Yes. And, and, and you're bringing them into some kind of data store and then performing analytics on that. Can you talk a little bit more about sort of what it looks like and maybe we can talk about the secret sauce? Well, sure. Uh, the data in the end analysis looks like a, a standard database. It looks like any other database that anybody would have uh, and in fact, from a usage standpoint, the end user doesn't know uh, that it came from anywhere different than anywhere else. And, and so, uh, from a standpoint of what does it look like, it looks like uh, any other analytical data that you've ever found. Now, uh, there is this issue of where does the data come from uh, in terms of voice, in terms of OCR, optical character recognition, those are some of the, uh, the issues related to uh, the subject of, of getting the data. And I'm going to have to say that uh, uh, the technology of voice recognition and transcription uh, is, is one of the links in the chain of being able to do what we need to do. So, uh, is the secret sauce in the voice recognition? Is it in how you handle the, the diverse data structures, both? Can you talk about that a little bit? The secret sauce, if there is such a thing as secret sauce is, uh, it's in the ability to, to find and understand context. And, and context of text uh, uh, is, is what gives us the capability to do a profound analysis of text. And, and, and the difference between what we do, say, and search processing is, is we don't do search processing, we go the next level and understand context. Once you understand context, then you're in a position to do analytical processing at a very different level than you've been able to do it before. Yeah, well I've always said search is kind of like a blunt instrument that people use because they can't figure out how to solve this problem that you, you presumably are solving. Um, but I'm still really interested in in how you're doing it, if you can share that. Is it a, is it a categorization? Is it semantics? Is it some new thing that you've invented? Is it, is it, is it math that's existed for decades? Dave, uh, number one, it has taken us 12 years time to learn how to do it. Number two, there is no one algorithm. Text is, or text, language is an inherently complex subject. And, and, and we take language for granted. Why? Because we speak it, because our mothers taught it to us when we were one years old, and we just, you know, to us, language is very natural and normal. But when you start to put language uh, uh, into a computer, it's anything but natural and normal. And so when it comes to the question of how do you do uh, contextual analysis, uh, you, have a hundred different ways that you do it. And, and why? Because in language, there's a hundred different ways that uh, a context occurs and appears to us in language. So, so, there is no one algorithm. There is no one way that you do it. Uh, the last time that myself and my group of researchers uh, had a conversation, uh, I, I think we're up to about 62 or 63 separate little algorithms that say, in this case, this is how you do it. In this case, this is how you do it. And, and so that's 
in the time that we have here, I could not possibly begin to tell you, well, you do it this way, because there is no one way that you do it. Well, let, let's let's take an example. And by the way, I want to apologize. I, I mispronounced the name uh, of your company. It's Forest Rim Technologies, Forest Rim your company. Technology. Uh, if we were to take a transcript of what we're talking about right now and mm -hmm. feed it into your into your engine, yep. what kind of, of con contextual setup would, would, would it require, and what could you give us out the back end? Okay. Uh, 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 the, the, the context of our conversation would be, uh, are we in Boston? Are, are we doing a TV show? Are we at a uh, conference on data and data quality? Uh, uh, are, are we grown men talking? Is it cold? Uh, what time of day is it? Um, um, is this a professional conversation or a casual conversation? Those are, those are all of the, the kinds of things that make a difference to the context of the conversation that we were having. And you need to be able to take those different factors and apply them to the text. So if we had a transcript of what we're talking about, we would take these external factors and say, okay, uh, this is what's going on here. Now, given that this is the context of what's going on, this is when I'm reading the text, this is how I interpret this to mean this. And so, this is what our, our technology and our software does. Then you take this information that we have created uh, and said, okay, this is the uh, uh, proper and appropriate interpretation of what's being said. We're now going to take that and put it into a standard relational database. Once I put it into a standard relational database, I can use a hundred different tools. I can use ClickView, I can use Tableau, I can use SAS, I can use business objects, I can use a, a, bunch, of, uh, uh, a, a bunch of tools to do the analytical processing against it. And so uh, uh, the, the trick is, uh, the number one, we have to have the content of what we're talking about. But then we have to be able to factor in uh, all of these other external uh, factors that make a difference as to what we're talking about to be able to appropriately interpret the meaning of the words. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your, your company, yes. um, for, Forest Rim uh, Tech. Right. Uh, you know, where are you at? When, when, you said you've been working on this for 12 years. You formed the company 12 years ago? Or? That's correct. Okay, so now you've got a product, right? You're That's correct. selling the product. And you're self-funded, is that right? Or? That's correct, I own the company. Awesome, That's, uh, we love that. <laughs> no VCs. No VCs. <laughs> All right. So where are you at with the company? I mean, you got you got uh, you got paying customers. I mean, can you talk about that a little bit? We working uh, with the NSA, I presume. We, they can't say. <laughs> we live in and work in most of us uh, in Colorado. Uh, I have partners in Dallas, Texas, and I've got some people in Chicago. Uh, so, but most of us are in the Denver uh, area. Number one. Uh, number two, we do have uh, uh, paying customers. We've got some very large companies. Uh, uh, we are, are working in the area of healthcare. Uh, we're working in, in uh, uh, the area of uh, call center for corporations. And then we have some other very well-known corporations that we're doing uh, other work with. I'm not at liberty, especially on television, to start to go into the, uh, the names of the corporations, but I promise you, you would know them. And I should mention, this is your third startup. Uh, the first one you took public, the second one you sold, so you have a pretty good track record in this area. Right. Uh, you, you're probably, uh, I want to be changing the subject here a little bit, Bill, but, but you're, you're also very well known. You're a prodigious writer, 52 books, it's, uh, remarkable. Uh, your latest one is about data science, I understand, That's the right. data scientist. Tell us a little bit about the, that book. Sure, the, uh, the publisher of the new venture is Elsevier Kaufman, the Morgan Kaufman, uh, I'm happy to say. Uh, and it's coming out in the month of November. Uh, uh, it's a book that talks about uh, data science from the standpoint of, of fundamentals. It, it's a, it says, I think there's a lot of, of conversation with big data and data science going on out there. Uh, 
And, and there, I think there's this tendency, at least for the people that I've talked with, in data science to, to be rather cavalier uh, 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 with regard to what I call fundamental information, things that they, they need to know. And, and so that was the inspiration for writing the book. Uh, a friend of mine, Dan Lindstead, and I sat down one day and says, gee, Bill, these people are all talking about big data and data science and all this kind of stuff. They should understand, they should know before they get into it that this is how things need to be structured, how things are structured, uh, et cetera, and so forth. And so uh, Dan Lindstedt is, is a, uh, a co-author of the book. Uh, Dan Lindstedt is known for something called Data Vault, uh, and he's contributing that part to the book. Uh, but uh, it's really a book for uh, the data science uh, uh, person because you know, you take a look at big data, you've got corporation after corporation uh, building things with big data. Uh, there is this need right now for people that, that have a deep understanding of all technology. And so uh, this book that we're producing is really a foundation book. It's not a book on how to do statistical analysis. It's not a book on, on a, uh, different techniques of, of analysis. It's a book on how things ought to be structured uh, in terms of volume of data, in terms of the physical media of data, in terms of uh, the meaning of data, uh, and all of the things that we work with. So um, my last question is, you know, a lot of young people in the audience interested in data. We're yep. some people get, get involved in data. You know, if you, if you like math, <laughs> statistics, data is the place to be. Um, what advice would you give to, to young people that are interested in, in this field? Let me tell you, I have a, a young lady that uh, is a, uh, the daughter of a friend of mine and she's going to college. And she and I were talking the other day and, and she's an ambitious young lady and a smart young lady. And she came to me and she said, Bill, she says, what, what, what could you tell me? What advice could you tell me? I want to succeed. And I said, look, I said the demand for data scientist is going to, is not is going to be, is already so large and it's going to grow exponentially that, 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 that if there's one thing I could tell you to do is go be a data scientist, go learn what it takes to take data and how to take that analytical data and turn it into useful business value and information. I said you do that and you're going to have a happy, successful career. But, uh, we talk about, of course, the uh, the relational era. Some people think the relational. We're moving into a post-relational era. Maybe it's it's a, it's a NoSQL era, or it'll be unstructured text. Will be, uh, will, will be data will be man, uh, managed in in less structured forms in the future. Do you see uh, new technologies in the database area that excite you? Um, that is a difficult question. I, I, I think, I, yes I do, I think there are some new technologies that are most interesting, but I think, I think the thing that, that I, I, I don't care for for that question is I, I think the emphasis. I think the emphasis in the future uh, is going to be uh, uh, not on the technology and database. N not that we, we still need them, they're still going to be important, but uh, it's going to be like turning a light switch on and off. When you turn a light switch on and off, you don't need to know that back in the wall is a wire, and this wire has got electrons, and those electrons are doing, you know, somebody needed to figure that out years ago, and it's important that it's there, but, but, but in today's world, we're more interested in, in, in the light switch and what it turns on and maybe the, the decor and, 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 and stuff like that. So I think that yes, there are some interesting database technologies that are, that are coming along, but I, I think that the emphasis on the, in, in the future is going to be uh, much more of an emphasis on can you provide to me uh, a measurable business value? I think that that's much more exciting than the technologies themselves. And 
we hear we and we hear a lot of talk now about about uh, about uh, uh, abstracting data at a higher level, about using tagging, semantics, metadata to really uh, go create uh, uh, industry standards. Uh, that that a, a lot of different companies can use is standardizing data across entire industries the way you know the manufacturing industry did did uh, many years ago. Do you do you see this coming together uh, uh, at, at a higher level? Or, are are we going to see more efforts to standardize data so that it can be shared easily across industries? Paul, when you take a look at standardization in the computer profession, standardization is done from, from commercial usage of a product. It's not done from committees of people sitting around saying we're going to do this and that and the other. That the truth of the matter is Bill Gates, Larry Ellison, and IBM uh, for the most part, they set the standards, but they don't sit down and, and, and think, well, I'm going to create a standard. They sit around and say, I'm going to create a product or a line of products, and then the product becomes so pervasive, it becomes the standard. So, yes, there are standards coming, but I believe that the way standards are going to be set is, is much more in product acceptance than, I, I guess I've seen in my lifetime so many committees and so many people, and, and those, those standards that people set with committees, they just never seem to happen. By the time they come together, they're, they're irrelevant, they're obsolete anyway. Absolutely. It's looking at data warehousing, I, have, I know it's been a decade, but I want to come back to data warehousing and, and where that's going. You know, we're seeing the evolution of distributed databases through, through uh, Hadoop, a uh, whole new approaches to data warehousing. Uh, the data warehousing concept. Does, does this excite you? Do you see a lot of uh, greater potential in this, uh, these much flatter, more distributed technologies? I think that data warehousing is becoming one of those switches, or one of those wires in the wall. I think that at one point in time, we in the industry were interested and concerned with what the wires look like and, and how many electrons were flowing. I think that was one time of, of great interest and importance. But I think that as time passes, uh, we're still going to need the wires, we're still going to need the electricity flowing through the wires, but it's going to be in the wall, hidden, and someone's just going to come along and turn the light switch on. So uh, I think in terms of interest level, I think Data Warehouse has a diminishing interest level it doesn't mean that it's going away. It doesn't mean that it's not important. It just means that it's become a standard part of the infrastructure. Have, just very quickly, the term big data, does it, is this a meaningful term to you or do you think this is just, just high, just a, another a new wine or old wine in the new bottle? No, I think, I, I, to me it has very much uh, a, a definite meaning. And I, I think I use the Silicon Valley uh, accepted understanding of big data. IBM wrote a book called Understanding Big Data, which I believe IBM gives away for free. And I think that in that book, IBM uh, pretty much described what big data is. In a recent Wikibon survey, only 5% of, uh, of people that we surveyed said that big data was a buzzword of unclear meaning. We asked that same question five years ago, ago of cloud, and I think 95% of the people <laughs> said cloud was a buzzword of unclear meaning. So uh, I think most of the community agrees with you, Bill. So, hey, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. It was really Thank a pleasure Thank you so having much. You. I pleasure. Great to meet Thank you. you, David. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Thank we'll be back you, with our next yeah. guest. We're live from MIT. This is theCUBE.